People have been suggesting that the top blocks on the pyramids, and they, they've sort of proven it, I guess, were poured much as you would pour concrete. What, what do you think about that? Okay, yeah, this is very interesting, and you're right. It is, uh, it is recent news. It's out of a thing called the Geopolymer Institute in France, mm-hmm. and um, it's associated with the re- research of a, of a guy called Joseph uh, Davidovitz, who um, has been suggesting for many years now uh, that the, the blocks, the limestone blocks of the Great Pyramid, and there's two and a half million of those blocks, um, that uh, some or all of them uh, may have been uh, created as a kind of concrete, that they ground down the limestone fine, turned it into a slurry uh, with, uh, with water, poured that slurry into molds, so it was easy to carry up. You needed to only carry up, you know, a jug full or a sack full at a time, pour it into molds, and those formed the, formed the blocks. Now, now there's obviously been uh, a lot of opposition uh, to this idea over the years, but uh, but just this month uh, there was new research published which seemed to endorse or support uh, that view that Egyptologists have have previously completely discounted. Now, my my position is I haven't uh, I, I I I haven't set my mind one way or another on this. I've climbed the Great Pyramid five times. And uh, I've had the opportunity to study very closely uh, many of the blocks, uh, some of which are extremely eroded and and broken. And what you find when you look at some of these blocks is that there are actually fossils um, trapped inside them. These fossils are called numulites. Hmm. And it's difficult to see how a fossil could survive the grinding up process uh, that would be necessary to create the slurry that was supposedly poured. All right. However, you, find, you find the slurry even on the higher blocks? Well, you see, this is, the, this is the thing, because if, if, if the suggestion is that it's only on the block, say, above 300 feet, the pyramid goes to five, 450 feet in height, actually originally 480 feet. Uh, if, if the argument is that it's only some of the blocks and not all of the blocks, then, you know, that, that, would, that would require further research. But my sense is in any block where they find a fossil embedded in the rock, uh, you're definitely not looking at concrete. You're, right. looking, you're looking at an original block. And another point, uh, which, is often, which is often missed, is that if it, even if this turns out to be the case, that, that, that the ancient Egyptians had mastered a kind of concrete uh, technology uh, much earlier, uh, concrete supposedly, I think, came in with the, with the Romans, that, they, that they'd mastered a concrete technology much earlier than that, um, there are still huge issues about how they moved enormous stones. For example, in the heart of the Great Pyramid, you have the so-called King's Chamber. Right. And although the majority of the Great Pyramid is indeed made out of limestone blocks weighing around two tons each, you find in the King's Chamber blocks of granite. Uh, and this, these gla- granite blocks weigh up to 70, 70 tons each, so you know, wow. 7,000 kilograms each. And there are hundreds of these blocks. And these definitely were not the result of some kind of concrete technology. We can say exactly where these blocks came from. They came from quarries in Aswan, about 500 miles south of Giza, and they must have been brought uh, on the Nile River uh, on gigantic boats up to, up to Giza. So, so whether or not the smaller blocks were created by concrete, we still have to deal with the problem of how the ancient Egyptians managed to lift blocks, weigh, blocks of pure granite weighing 70 tons to heights of hundreds of feet above the ground and position them perfectly in, in place uh, to construct this extraordinary geometrical puzzle called the, called the King's Chamber. So I think the, the concrete uh, argument is extremely interesting. Uh, it may uh, provide an answer to the enormous uh, scale. I mean, two and a half million blocks of stone is an awful lot of blocks of stone to lift and carry. If they could have poured most of them, that would have made their lives a whole lot easier. But it still doesn't solve the problem of how they lifted these, these gigantic blocks, for example, the granite blocks that I've just mentioned. Well, as you know, Zahi would be very happy to hear you say that, and I'm sure he's <laughs> He's ch- at the very least chafing a great deal at these recent stories. Well, if I know if I know Zahi and I've got to know him better over the years, um, you know he's not he's not going to he's not going to flatly resist scientific evidence which is being endorsed by other credentialed scientists, and that does seem to be the case here. There are other credentialed scientists who have joined Davidovitz and have said, look, at least some of these blocks are poured from a kind of concrete, and and if they are. 
Uh, I don't think it, as I say, I don't think it changes um, the mystery very much. It just says, okay, here's something new that we, that we know about the ancient Egyptians. But it's still those fossils, which I personally have seen with my own eyes in the heart of broken blocks, which say to me that certainly not all of the limestone blocks on the Great Pyramid were created this way. Do you have any guesses, uh, Graham, about how they, in fact, did get the obviously real blocks up to where they were? I mean, uh, nobody scientifically has ever said how it happened. No, it's never been done. I mean, the Egyptologists present us with this almost comic vision of, you know, tens of thousands of people hauling blocks uh, on, uh, you know, at the end of ropes. Yes. Uh, but really, human labor cannot, uh, you know, cannot haul a, a block weighing hundreds of tons or, or even tens of tons uh, on a slope more than 10 degrees. And if you, and if you want a 10-degree slope to reach, the, to reach 300 feet up where the king's chamber is, then that, that ramp, so-called ramp, is going to need to extend back nearly a mile into the desert and is, going to be, and is actually going to involve more material in its construction than is found in the Great Pyramid itself. Um, which uh, sort of defies, uh, you know, defies belief, really. So then, really, it's it's your position that a technology that we still don't understand was used. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I, 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 I find that feeling reinforced every time I revisit the Great Pyramid, and I was back inside and all over the Great Pyramid this uh, in June this this year. That there is <clears throat> there is something completely extraordinary and inexplicable about that gigantic monument. And, you know, no matter how much our scientists want to reduce all mystery in the world to nothing, they just can't do it with the Great Pyramid. It keeps on presenting them with challenges that, that cannot be solved. And those challenges are in your face. They're, they're right there. You climb above the king's chamber into the so-called relieving chambers above it, five chambers above the king's chamber, and along the floor of each of those uh, row of gigantic 70-ton granite blocks placed perfectly in pos- position with unbelievable pr- precision. And, and uh, you know, what it says to you in a very quiet, understated way is actually you are looking at something impossible here at least impossible in terms of our technology today.